we welcome you to our Bible study on the book of James. We want to encourage you to read the Bible for yourself and live out the spiritual insights as you rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you. We also want to encourage you to learn how to think, not just what to think. So why study the book of James? How is it relevant for us today? What makes the book of James captivating is its central message. Faith without works is dead. We live in a world saturated with words. There's no lack of Christian teachings, no lack of bold declarations of faith. But the book of James says that all these lofty words mean nothing unless we live out the words, unless we practice what we proclaim. Our identity as Christians is not just a label. If we claim to be Christians, we must live according to the teachings of Christ. Our identity as Christians has integrity only when we live out the teachings of Christ. The book of James, more than any other books of the Bible, appeals to our intention to act. In just five chapters, there are at least 55 imperatives or commands calling us to act, appealing to our intention. For example, within the first four verses, we have these verbs in the imperative form. Count it all joy, verse 2. Let steadfastness have, that's verse 4. And the rest of the book is full of the imperatives. Without the intention to act, our thoughts fizzle out and fade away and nothing comes out of a Bible study. If we want to change, then we must intend to obey the Word of God, the imperatives. That's why it's such a relevant book for today. So who wrote the book of James? And why does it matter who wrote it? The author identifies himself right at the beginning in chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, there are five people by the name James. Among the five, only two of them are well known. James, one of the original 12 disciples who was martyred early on and James, the brother of Jesus. Now, I won't go into technical details, but most likely the writer of this book is none other than the little brother of Jesus, technically a half-brother. The Lord Jesus was the eldest son in the house, and when his earthly father Joseph passed away, Jesus, being the eldest son, became the head of the household. Imagine how incredibly privileged the little James was to be taught by the Lord Jesus himself. But he didn't realize that while growing up, and the little James and other siblings did not believe what Jesus claimed about himself. Most likely, James became a believer after he encountered the risen Christ. What's really fascinating about this letter is the striking family resemblance. We hear the echoes of Jesus' teaching throughout the book of James, the echoes of the Sermon on the Mount, the echoes of Jesus' emphasis on living out the Word, His call to obedience, His call to discipleship. I believe that these are some of the things that Jesus taught in His earthly family, and we are hearing the echoes of that 
in the book of James. I understand why the translators use the term servant. The word slave carries a lot of negative connotations. But the Greek word is actually slave. And there is an important distinction between a servant and a slave. A servant provides a service to someone, and after providing the service, a servant's duty is done, and he can go home, go home and do whatever he wants. But a slave belongs to the master. And even after providing the service, a slave still belongs to the master. Being a slave of someone means absolute, total devotion to someone. And James presents himself not as a little brother of Jesus, but as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to whom was this letter addressed? And what challenges were they facing? The letter itself tells us who the recipients were. Uh, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. The twelve tribes are descended from the twelve sons of Jacob, and they represent the people of God. Uh, here in this immediate context, they refer to Jewish Christians or Jewish followers of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now, why are they scattered? because they were persecuted, not only by the Jewish people who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but also by the Roman Empire. From the book of Acts, we know that perhaps only months after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, the church began to be persecuted. In Acts 7, the deacon Stephen, after he preached a sermon in Jerusalem, was stoned to death. In Acts 8, Christians were dragged off from their houses and put into prison. The persecution intensified in the capital city, Jerusalem, so the Jewish Christians scattered to other places, such as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Now, in our nation, we Christians are increasingly being marginalized. And if we share biblical values on some subjects, we could be canceled or we could even lose a job. But that's not quite the persecution that the Jewish Christians were facing in the first century. Imagine a situation where you will be arrested, beaten, or even put to death by proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. To these Christians, James says in verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's from NIV and from ESV. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of many various kinds. Uh, let me digress a little. I have included sisters in these verses because James is obviously referring to the whole church. But in the Greek language, when they refer to the whole group of people, both men and women, they use the masculine form of the noun. That's just how the Greek language works. So James is referring to both brothers, and sisters. The imperative here is count it all joy. But how can we be joyful in the midst of trials? How can we do this? I believe that the key to understanding this imperative is the meaning of joy. So what is joy? Let me first explain what joy is not. Joy is not bubbly feelings. If that were the case, joy would quickly 
disappear the moment things are not going well. But joy means something entirely different. In the Greek language, joy is closely related to grace. The Greek word for grace is charis. You will recognize some English words derived from charis, such as charisma, which means gift, and eucharist, which literally means good grace. And the Greek word for joy, kara, has the same root as charis. Now, why is this important? We know that grace does not originate from us, but from God. Grace is unmerited favor that God bestows on us. In the same way, joy does not originate from us, but from God. Joy is from above. Joy is not the result of our own effort, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Dallas Willard define, defines joy in the following way. Joy is a pervasive sense of well-being. Joy is not happy, bubbly feelings that can easily be extinguished when we face trials, but a pervasive sense of well-being that flows from above. If joy is something that flows from above, then how can we receive it? We can receive it through an ongoing relationship with Christ by setting Christ always before our mind as often as we remember Him during the day. One of the great verses to carry with you is Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. There is a lot more to be said about this passage in James, but my purpose is to give you just a little bit of the background so that you can read it for yourself and learn from one another in your small group. Let me leave you with one thought. This is just one of the many ways to draw the diagram which I mentioned in the study guide, and I'm sure that you can come up with a better diagram. To me, the constant source of strength that enables us to persevere is the joy from above, that pervasive sense of well-being flowing down from above, that pervasive sense of well-being when we put Christ before our mind. And we can experience this joy even in the midst of trials by setting Christ always before our mind. So with this introduction to the book of James, I want to encourage you to think deeply for yourself. And the most important thing is to take time to live out the spiritual insights that the Lord has given you. God bless you.